Today's reading comes from the book of Genesis, beginning at chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And God said, Let there be light, and there was light. God saw that the light was good, and he separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning, the first day. And God said, Let there be an expanse between the waters to separate water from water. So God made the expanse and separated the water under the expanse from the water above it, and it was so. God called the expanse sky, and there was evening, and there was morning, the second day. And God said, Let the water under the sky be gathered to one place, and let dry ground appear. And it was so. God called the dry ground land, and the gathered waters he called seas, and God saw that it was good. Then God said, Let the land produce vegetation, seed-bearing plants and trees on the land that bear fruit with seed in it, according to their various kinds, and it was so. The land produced vegetation, Plants bearing seed according to their kinds, and trees bearing fruit with seed in it according to their kinds. And God saw that it was good, and there was evening, and there was morning, the third day. And God said, let there be lights in the expanse of the sky to separate the day from the night, and let them serve as signs to mark seasons and days and years. And let them be lights in the expanse of the sky to give light on the earth, and it was so. God made two great lights, the greater light to govern the day and the lesser light to govern the night. He also made the stars. God set them in the expanse of the sky to give light on the earth, to govern the day and the night and to separate light from darkness. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the fourth day. And God said, Let the water teem with living creatures, and let birds fly above the earth across the expanse of the sky. So God created the great creatures of the sea, and every living and moving thing with which the water teems, according to their kinds, and every winged bird according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. God blessed them and said, Be fruitful and increase in number and fill the water in the seas and let the birds increase on the earth. And there was evening and there was morning, the fifth day. And God said, Let the land produce living creatures according to their kinds, livestock, creatures that move along the ground and wild animals, each according to its kind. And it was so. God made the wild animals according to their kinds, the livestock according to their kinds, and all the creatures that move along the ground according to their kinds. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, Let us make man in our image, in our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air, over the livestock, over all the earth, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air and over every living creature that moves on the ground. Then God said, I give you every seed-bearing plant on the face of the whole earth and every tree that has fruit with seed in it. They will be yours for food. And to all the beasts of the earth and all the birds of the air and all the creatures that move on the ground, everything that has the breath of life in it, I give green plant for food. And it was so. 
God saw all that he had made, and it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. Thus the heavens and the earth were completed in all their vast array. By the seventh day, God had finished the work he had been doing, so on the seventh day he rested from all his work. And God blessed the seventh day and made it holy, because on it he rested from all the work of creating that he had done. Good morning, everybody. I'll go at an angle so I can sort of go like that. Oh, okay. Great. It's lovely to see you all. I met a number of you um, about 18 months ago. Um, We had a a West Midlands regional gathering over in Sutton Coalfield and a number of people from Elmden came over and uh, and met me and some of our team that night and it was a wonderful evening. Um, It's really nice to to have heard then after that from Leslie and Richard to come over and share a bit more about what we are doing on planet Earth right now. Um, and what more, more importantly, what is God doing on planet Earth right now? Um, and so this morning, I'm excited to be here, excited to share with you some of the things that God is doing. And one of the sort of buzzwords around in Wycliffe at the moment is acceleration, because there is a great acceleration of people groups and nations and, uh, and, and all sorts of communities around the planet that are asking us for the Bible because people are coming to faith. And that is from Asia, Africa, and as you will hear from one or two of the bits and bobs, I tell you, even here in Europe, God is breaking down walls. He's breaking down doors. He's finding people's hearts open in perhaps lots of places where we would think they would be totally closed. And so this morning, I would love it by the end of my presentation and sermon to you, I would love this. Not that you've just been informed, but that you have been inspired. Inspired that we have a God who is building his church and who is changing lives and changing communities right across the face of our planet in 2024. Okay? Rob, next slide, please. I'm going to do that very dramatically this morning because Rob is my sort of wingman for the morning. Next slide after that one, please, Rob. Oh, we could stay with that one if you like now. Okay. I think a lot of people, because we are about linguistics, we're about words, we're about um, sharing uh, communications with people, would think that our vision statement would be as heavy as that Bible that Richard moved. They think this is their vision statement, boom. But actually, everything that we do as an organization, as a mission, is summed up in this one phrase. This is our vision statement. Everything we do is to see a world where everyone can know Jesus through the Bible. Everything we do in every department of Wycliffe. This is what our goal is. This is what we pray into. This is what our aim is, is to put the word of God into the hands of people so they can read about, hear about, and meet God their saviour. That's everything we do. That's the end of my presentation. No, it's not. (laughs) But that does sum it up. That's the nutshell of my presentation today. Everything else sort of falls from there. Next slide, please, Rob. Over in the the, um, other hall here, please come and see me later because I have a table there where there is lots of literature that I would like to pass on to you and also to talk to you about some other things which I'll discuss a bit later. 
but also you will see a banner at the side of my table there. And there's a statement at the top of that banner. And the statement says this, one in five people are still waiting. And that is basically a fact that really still grips us as a as an organization, and I'm sure it shocks you this morning that 20% of the people on planet Earth do not have the Bible in the language that they speak every day in 2024. That's quite amazing, isn't it? That equates to 1.5 billion people do still not have the Bible in the language they speak at home every day. God, as I said earlier, has pressed a fast forward button so that that number is beginning to come down as God opens doors into communities and and nations amazingly. And the next two slides is a reflection of that. We, um, We have a report that we produce once a year called The State of the Bible. And it's basically an update on... How are we doing? What sort of a hole are we putting into that sort of number? How many people are we able to actually reach? How much impact are we having across the nations? I've just picked out four or five key facts, and all of them I think are exciting. This is taken from the the last, so this is 2023. The 2024 one is just about to come out. There were 367 brand new language projects. That's more than one a day. That's exciting, isn't it? Brand new language projects started in 2023. 49 full Bible or New Testament translations were launched. Now, I haven't got a film with me here today, but I have seen recently a couple of films of a Bible launch, and it's like one of the greatest parties on earth. And you see people dancing around in in some of the, the communities where we're able to hand it, each one would line up and just take a Bible. And some of the people take the Bible and stand there and hold it to their heart like it's the greatest treasure they've ever been given. And it's quite moving. And we have seen 49 brand new communities touched in the last 12 months. Next slide, please, Rob. Some of you might know, but probably most don't know, but there are over 7,500 languages on planet Earth. 7,500. I recently found out that actually there are 390 languages just in Nigeria, (laughs) which is quite amazing, isn't it, in one nation. But 3,266 languages now have some kind of work going on within them to bring them the word of God. That's amazing, isn't it? Lots of others have already got it. So obviously the English, French, German, all of those. But lots of languages around the world. We have found God opening doors into so many brand new communities and settings. And here is the fact that I really love sharing. Because all that we do is not about words. It's not about books. It's not about anything other than people. And in the 12 months that I'm talking about here, 16 million more people now have a Bible in the language that they speak every day than if I was stood here 12 months ago talking to you. That's amazing, isn't it? 16 million. And I can, I can give you a sneak preview. The report that's coming out for this year, which is just about to be printed in the, in the next few weeks, there is significantly more than that in 2024. So be excited. Our God is on the move. Our God is penetrating this 
planet with his word, which brings life to people. Next slide, please. I'm going to be sharing, as was mentioned earlier, from the beginning of the Bible, from Genesis. But I'm going to link in what I talk about this morning with another scripture that's really been blessing me recently and I think has some relevance. So I'm just going to just read these few verses to you, which I'll repeat during my sermon, but it's Jeremiah 18, verses 1 to 6, says this. The word came to Jeremiah from the Lord, go down to the potter's house and there I will give you my message. So I went down to the potter's house and I saw him working at the wheel. But the pot he was shaping from the clay was marred in his hands. So the potter formed it into another pot, shaping it as seemed best to him. Then the word of the Lord came to me and said, Can I not do with you, Israel, as this potter does, declares the Lord. Like clay in the hand of the potter, so are you in my hand, O Israel. So we'll come back to that a little bit later. Our creator God, he's amazing, isn't he? He is amazing. Next slide, please, Rob. One of the amazing things about being involved in Bible translation is that it goes hand in hand with transforming not only spiritual life, but also just life in general, because we have an awful lot of projects where we work closely on literacy skills, on life skills, uh, as well as putting into the hands of the people there the Bible so that they can find Jesus too. And so, for instance, uh, mothers who, didn't, who weren't able to read labels on medicine jars to get the right medication for their children now can. People who couldn't fill forms in to qualify for certain things in certain places can now read them. And, and so we're, we're able to arm people through literacy and through the Bible, and through love, to really be living new lives. Lives with more opportunity. Lives with more hope. Life with more purpose. I want to tell you a story about a young man with the wonderful name of Kodya Odar. Kodya is from the West African nation of Togo. And Kodya was brought up in a family who were of the animist religion. And he was being trained from being a very small child to become a voodoo priest. That was the way of his life. He was taken out of mainstream education And all that his life revolved around was being shaped to become a voodoo priest within this animist religion. When he was 15, some friends of his said to him, I hear there's something going on a couple of villages away. I think we should go and see what's happening. So he said, yeah, yeah, let's go, let's go. Unbeknown to Kodia and his friends... What was going on was a gospel tent mission run by the Baptist Church and by Wycliffe Bible Translators. And we had just produced the New Testament in the language that Kodia speaks, which is called Ife. What's it called? Ife. Ife. I-F-E. It is spoken by around about two and a half million people across the nations of Togo and Senegal. And that night, Kodia and his friends came to this gospel tent and heard for the very first time something they'd never heard before. And Kodia said this, I heard for the first time that those who find Jesus as their saviour go to heaven and those that don't go to hell. To me... That was good news because I accepted Jesus into my heart. He went home, told his mother and father, and they threw him out. 
and his community threw him out. He had to go with some of his friends who'd also found Jesus that night and live in this village some way from his home. And he started taking literacy classes. He now had a New Testament in Ife to read, to get to know Jesus all the better. That was nine years ago. Kodia Oda now leads the largest Baptist church in that part of Togo. He's a qualified Baptist minister. And he badgers Wycliffe the whole time because we have taken longer than we said in producing the Old Testament in Ife. <laughs> because the Old Testament's always harder than the New Testament, as you can imagine. But we are almost there. But he regularly, I believe, I, I've, I've not had contact with him, but there are members within my project team who get regular calls. When we're going to have the Old Testament? How can I lead a church with no Psalms, no Isaiah, no Genesis in Ife? But he's doing a wonderful job. And what a story of transformation that isn't it? He was on this trajectory, this path to become a voodoo priest to curse people for the rest of his life. Now, he's blessing people as the leader of an incredibly incredibly fast-growing church there in Togo. That's the sort of transformation that comes about when people have the translation that speaks to them in their locality, in their own hearts. Next slide, please, Rob. I mentioned earlier that uh, we... Most of our projects revolve around the the continents of Africa and Asia. But around about two years ago now, we were approached by a committee of ministers uh, who represented churches across around five or six Central European nations. So it was Romania, Bulgaria, Hungary, Moldova... Czech Republic and Serbia. And they had met in Bucharest and they had met because they all have a common denominator within their congregations, within their churches, and that is people are coming to faith in big numbers, but most of them come from the Romani community, the travelers of Central Europe. There is a revival going on amongst what we would perhaps here know as the gypsy people of Central Europe are coming to faith in actual hundreds, if not thousands, across Central Europe. And they are spilling over into the mainstream churches of those cities and those nations. And here's the problem. There are 16 different Romani dialects. And there isn't one standard Bible. And so this committee of ministers approached us and they approached us with this question. Would you help us to put together one unique Romani translation of the Bible? knit together these 16 dialects into something that works for all these communities. And we said, yes. And we've now completed the book of Acts. We've now got study resources on Acts and John. And literally in a couple of weeks' time, a couple of members of the team that I'm part of are going out to Bucharest because we're launching Matthew and Mark as well in this new Romani language, and it is being incredibly well received. And the people there are finding it wonderful. It is an eight-year project. So when you become a supporter, and the church here at Elmden are already a supporter of Wycliffe, but as a supporter of Wycliffe Bible Translators, the two stories I've just told are sort of 
the, the, the thing that God is doing, he's doing it with people groups in places like Togo, places where the, 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 the mainstream religions there have been of all sorts of different um, backgrounds and all sorts of different beliefs and people coming to faith from, as I say, animist backgrounds, from, uh, from, from humanist, all, all sorts of backgrounds. And right in the heart of Europe, our own continent, mostly these Romani people have come from a Catholic background or they've come from a no faith at all background and are coming to faith. So you can see the diversity of peoples that are being affected by putting a Bible in their hands so they can meet Jesus. The incredible thing about um, this Romany story is this. I'm sure all of us here pray for the nations, pray for people. And we have all sorts of evangelistic uh, opportunities as churches, as individuals, and we, we, you know, we tell our friends, we do events, we, all, we do all of that. And the Holy Spirit, I believe, is the greatest evangelist on the planet because this is what he's doing right now. He's making the people who are moving about the most come to faith the most. <laughs> Do you understand what I mean? The Romani people, we're already hearing it spill over into two or three other nations already. And they are affecting the churches and stirring the churches and affecting the... What an, what an evangelistic endeavour, isn't it? Here's the other incredible endeavour. We have a, an arm of our work, which we call the persecuted church work. And that is where we're involved in translation work in nations where Christianity is actually a very dangerous thing to follow. I had the incredible honour of going to Tunisia in March uh, of last year. And we met about 50 or 60 lovely Christian people. And we sort of met in, in, in a, a, a sort of an Anglican church, but in the sort of basementy bit. Because the common denominator with all of these people is, we love Jesus, but none of our family know. If, we, if, if it was found out that we were not following Islam anymore, we would probably be killed. And yet, in those nations, people are still coming to faith in big numbers. We are hearing about revivals in places like Iran, in other nations that you would think are totally close to the gospel. The Holy Spirit is coming to people in dreams. He's coming to people in visions. He's going through borders where nobody else could get through. And so be excited. God is building his church from the nations through his word. Next slide, please. I mentioned earlier that I have lots of literature which I'd like to give to you. There are, whenever I travel around to churches, this is, um, my heart is this, that you guys would want to partner with us. As a church, yes, which like I say, Elmden already do, but as individuals too. And there's, there's a few different ways of doing that. So one way is that you can join Wycliffe. How do you do that? How, do, how can I join Wycliffe? Well, there's a few different ways. We have all sorts of sort of different roles that go on here in the UK. So we have people who do proofreading for us of various things. We have people who organise prayer events. We have people who uh, do all sorts of organisational things. And our human resource department are always looking for people. So if you've been stirred in your heart today and you'd like to know more about that, I have a form for you, which I'd love you to take away. Next slide, please, uh, Rob. Most importantly, 
we need you to partner with us in prayer. I'm sure that all of you here are prayers, and I'm sure that some of you are actual warriors in prayer for the things that are going on in our world. And today, I would love you to take some details away of the things that you can be praying into, the key things that are happening, so you can become a joiner, not a a joiner, or a prayer. Next slide, please, Rob. This is the part of my job that is, I find the most difficult, but I'm, and I'm, so I get it, get it over with quickly, but I need to sort of underline it a little bit, if that's okay. As I say, Elmden as a church here already support us, but there's an opportunity today, um, and God has done this as an amazing thing. I'll talk about this in a, in a, in a couple of minutes, but... We started a, a thing called Give the Word around about a year ago. And what it is, it's a direct debit commitment of £10 a month to, so that we know that there are people who are giving £10 a month to help support our work. Somebody who's been a long-term supporter of Wycliffe, a long, long time, an elderly gentleman, found out about this He's now retired. I presume he's quite wealthy. And he approached us and said this, everybody over the next two years who signs up for this direct debit scheme, I will match it. So every time somebody signs up, we actually start to get £20 a month rather than 10 That's incredible, isn't it? If you would like to do that and there's no pressure, as I say, we're not that, not that sort of organisation because give us your money. But if you are able to, if you think, I'd love to do that, I'd love to be partnering by doing that, please get one of these, come, if you could come and fill one of these forms in for me, that would be wonderful. The other thing, if God's just put on your heart and you'd like to support us in a financial way that's sort of outside of what the church is doing, we've now been armed incredibly in the 21st century with card readers because nobody has cash anymore, do they? So if you'd like to give a donation, uh, and again, there's absolutely no pressure, I have a card reader machine. All you need to do is come and just zap it and then just give me a little bit of detail. That's the money bit over, okay? So thank you for that. I'll put it over here so it doesn't distract me. But there are lots of bits of literature there I'd love you to take away. This magazine, Words for Life, is a quarterly magazine. I have two versions of it with me today. If he had lived, John Wycliffe would have been 700 this year. He didn't quite make it. He died when he was 83. But it would have been the 700th year of his life. And so we've celebrated by having all sorts of events this year. This is a magazine that just tells you all about that. So that's very interesting if you want to take one of those. That is the, the most up-to-date quarterly words for life. I mentioned earlier about the statistics and everything of, of what's going on. That piece of literature is very interesting as well. And this is all about the people groups who are still in that 20% who are not reached. So please come and take some literature off me. I'd love to share that with you. Next slide, please, Rob. Shall we pray? Then we'll look at God's word together. And I promise you, I won't be long. Lord God, we thank you that your word is life. Thank you that your word brings faith. Thank you that your word illuminates our way. Uh, and I do pray this morning that everything we hear about you, Lord God, would trigger faith in our hearts. It would awaken hope in our hearts. It would, uh, it would feed us, Lord God, because you've said that your word is actually that men shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes out of your mouth. And we want to hear from your mouth today, Lord. Amen. Amen. Wasn't it great to hear, I think sometimes we get too familiar with the very, very start of the Bible. The Genesis story, oh, Adam and Eve, we've heard that since we've been kids. We don't need to read that again. We don't need to hear all that. We've no, we know what God did then. But it was lovely to hear it again, wasn't it, this morning? Our God 
is the creator of everything. I'm only going to read two verses to recap. I'm not going to go through the whole thing. But there's something within the first two verses of the Bible that set the scene for God's activity with his people forever. And I'd just like to touch on that this morning. As the creator... In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. For all time, God has been looking at the raw and the empty and the lifeless, and the misshapen, and the dark, ready, hovering, to speak life into those situations. To bring fullness where there is emptiness. To bring life where there is death. To bring light where there is darkness. As the creator, the spirit of God hovering over the waters is a picture of our God's heart for all he has made. For all that he has made. He wants to bring life. He wants to bring hope. The creative work that he wants to be about forever comes to its pinnacle when he created me and you. When he created us, the human race, in his image. Yes, he wanted to bring life to the planet. Yes, he wanted to breathe life into what was formless and empty. And here's the pinnacle. You might look in a mirror sometimes and think, I don't really feel much like the pinnacle of God's creation. <laughs> but we are. We are the apple of his eye. We are made in his image. His creation of us was all about relationship. He made us so that we could know him. He made us so that we could love him. He made us so that we could share all that he is and all that he has. And this picture of hovering over is still true. The Holy Spirit hovers over each of our lives every day. Knocking. Wanting to come in and relate to us and love us and create new things within us. God the Creator is not a title, it's His nature. He's a creator. He makes things new. He makes old things new. He makes dead things alive. He makes sick things well. And didn't Jesus reflect that wonderfully? He says Jesus was the express image of the Father. Everything that he touched came to life. People were fed when they were hungry. People were healed when they were sick. People were raised from the dead when they died. It's a reflection of the creator God. Because Jesus was right there at the beginning as well in this whole hovering thing. And then he became flesh. Um, The passage in Jeremiah that I read earlier, I'm just going to touch on for a few minutes before we finish. Because it's very 
apt, I think. It talks about a potter and clay. And I'm not really going to focus much on the clay, which is us. I'm only going to say two things to us as the clay. Remain pliable. That's all we've got to do. In this creator people thing, in this God and us thing, all we have to do is remain pliable. Don't harden our hearts. Remain pliable, soft, so the potter can create something fresh, something new. I mentioned that God's heart's always about revelation. He always wants us to know more of who he is. And then we can consider what he can do. And I started to list scriptures about his nature, about who he is. And we would have been here till about Thursday afternoon if I'd have listed them all. Because <laughs> there's just so many. And I thought, I can't, you just can't, you know, I didn't have enough paper to write them all on. But I was reminded, and some of you perhaps will know this song, and some of you won't. I'm not going to sing, I promise you. But there's a wonderful song called Indescribable by a man called Chris Tomlin that was around some years ago, and still sung at times. But there are words within this song that I just want to share with you this morning because I think they sum up who we are talking about this morning when we talk about the potter and when we talk about the creator God. From the highest of heights to the depths of the sea, creation is revealing your majesty. From the colours of fall to the fragrance of spring, every creature is unique in the song that it sings. They're all exclaiming. You're indescribable, uncontainable. You place the stars in the sky and you know them by name. You are amazing, God. You're all powerful, untamable, awestruck. We fall to our knees as we humbly proclaim. You are amazing, God. Who's told every lightning bolt where it should go? Or seen heavenly storehouses laden with snow? Who imagined the sun and gave source to its light and yet conceals it to bring us the coolness of night? None can fathom. You're undescribable. You're uncontainable. You place the stars in the sky and you know them by name. He's amazing, isn't he? He's our creator. He created everything and yet he's interested enough to want to create new things within us. There is a translation of the Bible which some of you may have come across called the Passion Translation. And I've got to be quite honest with you, it's a mixed bag. There are some parts of it that are wonderful and very descriptive and very helpful and there are other parts of it that aren't. <laughs> I'm going to leave it there. But there's one passage that I'd just like to read from Psalm 51, verse 17 from the Passion. It says this, The fountain of all your pleasure is found in the sacrifice of my shattered heart before you. You will never despise tenderness as I bow down humbly at your feet. If we remain pliable, the limits are off what our God can do with us. How he can shape us. How he can, as was read there in Jeremiah, look at us and think, there's some marring there, but I, I, can come, I, can, I can deal with that marring. 
I can deal with that fault. I can deal with that if we stay pliable. You'll never despise tenderness. Some of the more mainstream translations will say, I will not despise a broken and contrite heart. When we are broken and contrite, when we are pliable and soft, God has the limits taken off his creative power within us. It's all about relation. It's all about heart to heart. And so when we think this morning about our creator who's been hovering over creation forever, wanting to bring life, let's have an open door on our hearts to come in and do whatever he wants with us, yeah? To create something new in us. Shall we just pray to finish? Thank you, Father God, that you are the creator of everything. Thank you that you are our God and that your, your heart for us is that we know you and that we are like you and that we love you and that we are readied for heaven, Lord God. And I just pray this morning, Lord God, that you would just come and do a melting work in our hearts. Lord God, come and do something fresh in each of our hearts this morning as we just submit to you as our creator and our God. Amen.